Welcome to Redbeard Radio. I'm Brian Keith, and we're talking today about what happens when you hit a plateau on your path to mastery. It's really easy to look at outside yourself, at people who are, let's say, professional athletes, and you can say, oh, well, these people, they're always amazing. They're always fantastic at what they do. But the reality is that everybody, including those of us building our businesses, hits plateaus, and then we have to push through the plateau onto the other side and keep on moving forward. We have today here James Kluski of Give Learn to help us understand what happens in his own professional career as a tennis player, as he hit plateaus and pushed through them, and also as a tennis coach to Richard Branson. James, welcome to Redbeard Radio. Thanks for having me, Brian. Now, I'm excited about this topic area because I have a few things in my life where I have plateaued and plateaued hard, and sometimes I push through them to the other side, and sometimes I gave up and resigned myself to failure. And I think about when I was a trombonist back in my school days, that there were some of my fellow trombonists who pushed forward in their jazz skills, and they pushed to where they could play good improv jazz solos in a concert setting. And I never stepped up to the challenge. I wimped out. I didn't pursue that. It was too scary and too hard. And then I look at mountain climbing, where I pushed through those plateaus up to the point where I was leading a rope team on Mount Rainier, a 14,000 foot mountain, and pushing through and just becoming, becoming more and more of that leader and that responsible person. So I both pushed through, but also flinched when I've hit plateaus in my own life. I'd love to hear from you a story. Well, let's start off. I shared one of my stories of my failure. What's one time in any part of your life where you hit that plateau and you didn't push through it? Yeah, really good question. I think really interesting topic. Um, in terms of a time where I, I suppose, hit a plateau and didn't push through, I think I got to my highest ranking in the world in tennis, which was 145 in the world. And um, so to give context for non-tennis people, there's, you know, there's people that play professionally and they never get ranked in the world. There's a couple of thousand players ranked in the world. And when you get one world ranking point, you go in the rankings at about, I think about three or 4,000 now in the world. So I set my initial goals to obviously get my world ranking point and start moving up the rankings. And first goal to be inside a thousand, then to get inside 500. And obviously it gets harder the further you go up. Uh, I got to one, four, five. I got inside 150, which was a big goal of mine. And then the next goal was to get inside 100. And I didn't get through that next, I suppose, that next hurdle. Um, and I think for me, do I have regrets around it? Maybe a little bit. But I also, I think I knew that that was probably the highest ranking I could get to. Um, but in terms of plateaus, I, I really believe that it's so important that the people that you're surrounded with, um, you know, whether it's friends, coach, that support system that really encourage you to drive on and to believe in yourself and to keep going because using the mountaineer example, it's like, it's just over that hill, you know? <laughs> I think that picture of when someone's digging for gold and it's just, you know, it's, it's almost there. Who would you say was the most important person? Let's say when you were trying to get into the thousand top ranked tennis players of the world, Who's the person who mattered the most to you, keeping on going even when things got hard? Yeah, I had a coach when I was from the age of 14 to 18 before I went to college in the US. So I'm from Ireland. And it was a guy called Larry Jervich, who's a Canadian, Canadian coach who moved to Ireland. And the interesting thing about tennis is tennis is an individual sport. And, you know, just so in terms of SMEs and businesses and so on, sometimes you can be, you know, obviously a sole founder. But actually what really stood out is how important that support system was, how important that community was. So when I was 14, we trained, there was six or seven guys who were all around the same level. Larry created this culture where everyone was pushing each other to be the best player they can be. What he really did was change our perception and, you know, I suppose, teach us how to work hard, but then also to believe in ourselves and believe that we were better than uh, we thought we could be, you know? So I think that makes a massive difference. And even coming from that individual sport, how important that support system is in terms of driving you forward. When you think of that drive you developed in your late teens, uh, how applicable is that to what you're doing with your company, Give Learn? I think it's incredibly similar. I mean, I think 
not to get too philosophical, but I think when you finish playing professional sport, when you're in the middle of your professional sport and, and you're trying to rise up the rankings, you're very clear on what you want to do. So when I would meet someone, I'd say my ranking is 200. I want to get to 150. I'm playing this tournament, this tournament, this tournament. When you retire from professional sport, I think it's sometimes hard to find, to continue the mountain analogy, but that next mountain to climb. But actually, when you find that mountain, when you find that next mountain that you want to scale and climb, I think it's very, very similar to the tennis career in terms of business. Um, I think there's a lot of similarities between you know, high-performance sports people and high-performance business uh, owners and so on. So I think it's just becoming clear on what that next mountain you want to climb is. I have a story that I'm not actually sure I've shared on this podcast ever. So this is going to be a fun one, James. Oh, great. Back in 2013, I was still very active in the medieval sword fighting community, which is sort of like mixed martial arts, but with swords. And that was around the time that the United States was getting into a, uh, a new kind of sword fighting called the Battle of the Nations, where it's metal armor, metal weapons, full contact. This is very popular over in Europe. It was not popular in the States. Mm. And at the time, my coach for my sword fighting was one of the best sword fighters in the United States. I just got lucky being in the same geographical area as him near Seattle. And he said to me, he said, you know, I think with enough work that you could be good enough to lead the second team, like lead the B team. Uh, and there's usually three teams of guys go to these things. This would be leading a five-man team. And I wasn't strong enough or skilled enough to be one of the guys who was there just because I was a good fighter because I wasn't I wasn't a great fighter I was I was completely adequate but my commanding experience combined with being an adequate fighter with enough practice it's not like I was there but he, he thought that I could be there and I thought long and hard about this because all, all my friends were starting to do it my fellow sword fighter buddies they're all going to go and this is sort of like going to the Olympics is what the sword was like. There's no Olympic sword fighting in this, of this particular thing, but the Battle of the Nations is the closest thing there was at the time. And I looked at myself and I thought, okay, this is the second year of my business, okay? And I thought, am I sure that I can perform at a high level growing this business, growing Redbeard Consulting, and also performing at a high level pursuing an Olympic athletic career? And my answer was, no, I'm not sure I can do both those things. Maybe I can, but I don't know. Well, that leads you to which one do you want more? What if a decade from now, which happens to be right now, you could either be an Olympic class, <laughs> you have fought the best people in the world, you know where you rank, or you could have a thriving business. Which do you want? Now, I chose the business route and I did not pursue the level of the kind of intensity you're talking about with your tennis where you're trying to be the best and everyone knows it. <laughs> I saw that in my friends who pursued that path as they traveled around the world sword fighting. And I admire them, envy them perhaps a little bit. I saw one of them a little while ago, gave him a hug. This guy's built like an ox. He spent the last decade training to be one of the best sword fighters in the world. <laughs> and I admire that. And I also see that, yeah, and I've spent the last decade focused on business and focused on small business growth. And it's just this different path. So what about you, James? Do you ever look at that tennis time and you think, wow, I sort of wish I'd done something else instead of putting so much energy into this one pursuit? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. First of all, I mean, I don't know you that well, Brian, but I'm like, this guy is the coolest guy ever. I mean, he's in sword fighting and like climbing mountains and all this stuff. So I'm like really interesting. And you used the word focus there a couple of times as well. And I think a lot of people, you know, whether it be sports people, whether it be business people you know it's focus is such a key word isn't it and if you try and stretch yourself by doing loads of little things and maybe you'd have a, an okay business and you'd be an okay sword fighter but if you had focused on one you know you focused on your business obviously and growing that and so on I think that word focus is is really important the second part of the question so for me in terms of tennis I don't regret my career one bit I've been lucky enough to play a sport that you can play forever. I mean, I, I was playing tennis over the weekend, so I can play it forever. Then secondly, I learned a lot. I mean, I traveled the world. I traveled for 40 weeks a year for six, seven years. Um, I met some incredible people along the way. Tennis has opened some great doors for me in terms of business and connections and all that sort of stuff. So 
I think we are our journey. And, you know, I think of in terms of life experience. And I remember actually uh, one of my experiences, I met a, a really successful VC guy and he said he invests in interesting people and interesting companies. And I think you want to meet interesting people and people with stories. And I think you learn a lot from that journey as opposed to maybe just kind of taking the safe route in life. Yeah, the safe route is uh, <laughs> never safe. I want to hear more about plateaus. And one, of your, one part of your story is that you are the tennis coach for Richard Branson. And we read his books, we read about all his victories. You've seen this guy both perform at a high level, but you've also seen him, I'm going to assume, hit plateaus in his training. I assume this because every athlete I've ever heard of hits plateaus in their training. And I bet there's something that Branson does that is not average when he hits a plateau. Is there anything about that that you can share with us? Yeah, so I've been lucky to to be working with Richard since 2015, traveling out to Necker Island. He's got a, a tennis event. The first part of that, as I'd say, is you never really know where one phone call is going to take you. And one phone call has taken me to a, a lot of cool places, including Necker Island. In terms of plateaus and, and learning from Richard, a couple of things really stand out. So for me, it's how relentless he is with his training and his practice. And and I use that word relentlessness because I actually asked him once and he said the word relentless. You know, I did 30 days with him last year. He played tennis 28 days, twice a day. So the guy, is a, he's a machine uh, when it comes to training and and. He really believes that when he's physically active and physically fit and that he's more productive business-wise. In terms of plateaus and and actually on the tennis court, he's a big believer in playing points and playing in in match situations. So we would play a lot of points. And to relate that to kind of business, it's, it's obviously getting in that environment of, you know, real things happening. And in terms of his tennis, I think, again, the biggest thing I've, I've really taken from him is how hard he works on the court. I meet him every morning, 6.15, for a cup of tea and a chat, and then we go and play. And then every evening he plays as well. No matter what is going on in, in his you know, business life, personal life, he's always on the tennis court. And I think, you know, what's the saying? Half the battle is just showing up. And I think in business and plateaus and so on, I think what I learned from him is that, you know, you got to get up in the morning and, and show up and work hard and good things will happen if you put yourself in the situation. So... Um, I've been really lucky to, you know, spend a lot of time with them and, and really pick up uh, lots of different little things. Let's shift to talking about your company, Give Learn. The story you just shared of Branson is far more about the soft skills and the attitude than it is about some technical this or that. And that's the focus of your company is those soft skills. Can you tell us some more about what you do there? Yeah, so I'm the founder of Give Learn. So we help SMEs really win and, and retain the best employees. We believe in the soft skills. So we have a full calendar of sessions where we offer both live and on-demand virtual classes, all in the soft skills space. So we have different classes every month, different themed months where we have things like presentation skills, mindset, listening, all these different areas of soft skills. You know, I think that the stat from the World Economic Forum is that by 2025, uh, they predict that eight out of 10 of the most valued skills will be psychologically based. So we're very lucky to work with companies and they give their employees the gift of give, learn. And then secondly to that, you know, I'm really passionate about building a company that's you know for profit before good as well and, and as a force for good. And so what we do with our classes is that we link learning to doing good in the world. So when users take our classes and engage with our classes, they earn points and they can use those points to donate to different uh, social causes. So there's a link to doing good as well. That's fantastic. What do you see is our biggest weakness? And by our, I mean, uh, let's say small business people in the Western world, as you're seeing more people come up who grew up not just with the internet, but they didn't know time before having cell phones in their hands. Where do you see our biggest gaps are that we need to solve? Mm, I think it's a fascinating question. And I think it's a, it's a really interesting one. I think from speaking to companies around younger professionals coming into the workplace and obviously moving through the kind of COVID world and so on, 
that these skills around things like networking is a big thing that comes up is how to build your network, how to present, how to communicate, how to listen. Let's pause on networking that I remember back. I, I studied business in school. I got a, what was my degree called? It was a bachelor of arts in business administration with a emphasis on entrepreneurship. So it was an entrepreneurship undergrad degree. And I remember they had networking sessions and classes. And looking back at that, I think about what we were told about how to network. And I think you guys, of course you don't know how to network. You have nothing valuable to give. Mm. You have no useful experience, really. You don't know anyone. So you, you can't open up your network to someone else. And I get how they have to talk about networking anyways to college kids but they don't know anything. They have no value yet. And so how do you look at, how do you take people who are on the newer side, newer in the workforce and teach them networking even as they don't know how to do anything yet? It's a very good question as well. I mean, I think it takes time to build a network. And then also I think it's to move away from, I think a lot of people see networking as, uh, you know, getting business cards and very transactional and, you know, what can I get from the other person as opposed to what can I do for the other person or how can I help the other person? I think it's going with that attitude. I also think it's about, you know, playing a longer term game. Yes. In terms of that, it's not, you know, you meet someone at an event and then the next day you're like, we all know that person when our phone rings and we're like, oh my God, what does this person want? So it's around cultivating the relationship um, I think Keith Ferrazzi, uh, I don't know if you've come across Keith Ferrazzi. He's a great guy in networking. Yeah. He talks about like stoking the fire. So you need to keep the fire lit. If I can give an example of one of the people that I met on Necker, um, is a guy, Tim Gannon, is the founder of Outback Steakhouse, um, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. So Tim invented the, the Bloomin' Onion. I always remember meeting Tim on Necker and he's obviously a very busy man, but I would read articles on the food industry and I'd every month or two, I'd send an article and I'd say, Hey, I read this on the food industry. It might be interesting to you or just kind of keeping that touch point, keeping in touch with him. Uh, and then he invited me to an event that he was getting an award for. Um, he's an Irish American and we built a great relationship over time, but it's a reciprocal relationship, right? I'm giving him value and he's given me value and I've learned from him and so on. So I think it's to think about it in a different way as opposed to what can I get from you? Yeah, I've come to look at it, look at networking as it's a question of value alignment. And I share some values with everybody. If I talk to you long enough, I'll discover something. We'll discover something that we are aligned in our values on. And once we discover that thing, the question is, how can we move that value forward? There's this thing that is outside of you, James, and outside of myself. Like in this conversation today, one of the things we're talking about is mastery and how do you pursue mastery and achieve mastery? And mastery is not your thing. It is not my thing. It's a thing we both pursued, but I can, I, we can both be in support of this value. And once we understand that, well, now I can say, and once we hit end record, I'm going to go give you some names of people that could be useful to you in pushing mastery forward. And because I know, okay, this is our shared value. And so the game is when they need a new person, it's, well, where do our values match? And then what can I do to support that in the present and in the future? And that is not what they told us back in college. I'm not sure, to be fair, that I could have grasped what they meant in the way that I grasp it now. And maybe I had to go live through it until I could get what I just said. I don't know. And you were probably even lucky to be taught some kind of networking in college, right? I mean, it's not... It wouldn't be commonly thought as well, but I do think it's reframing the way we think about networking and growing our network and so on. And networking, it's hard work, right? It's You're investing in relationships and it takes time. And, and we have a networking program on our platform and we've had one previously. And uh, one of the guys was who, who thought it uh, was talking about how it's it's almost like a an ATM or air miles where you're you're kind of collecting miles and then at some point you can cash them in. So it's about building that support system and we all need it. Yeah. Well, James, this conversation has led across about a dozen different topics. So for folks who want to learn more about James, you can go to givelearn.net. That's the company. You can find James on LinkedIn, James-Kluski, that's C-L-U-S-K-E-Y. 
And then James, you also wrote a book. We didn't even talk about your book, Advantage Lessons in Sport and Business to Achieve Your Goals. That sounds fun. James, thank you for joining us on Redbeard Radio. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for having me and uh, look forward to hearing from everyone. Again, if you've enjoyed listening to me, just go to givelearn.net.